Hello and welcome to another one of Phil and Hugh's little podcasts. Um, this is Hugh Waters over here in Gloucestershire. Waters Technical Services, there will be a strap line that pops up, I dare say. And over in jolly old London town is young Phil. Less, and, less uh, of the young. Look at all this grey hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hair would be handy. Um, today we're going to be talking about something really interesting and really engineering and, and dirt under the fingernails type thing. This is custom electronics and home brewing. And I know what you're thinking. This is all about beer, but no, not quite. Home brewing in the electronics fashion. Um, but we were just having, before we started recording, we are just having a little chat about um, home brewing things that we knew about. And saying when we we did it and i was just thinking back to some old days at uh, when i used to work at a company called telecine i wonder what they did um where we used to because it was largely a dupe house we made these panels with old, i think it was eight little mini ppms all in but you could buy things like that you had to make them yourselves and lots of interface boxes and stuff like that and it was all done with relays and big wire is that is that still how we do it well, yeah, a bit. Obviously, lots of things um, you need to switch with a relay. So, so the the, the thing that, that bites me in the backside all the time is is GPIs and tallies. Uh, you, you know uh, that you often hear the expression "wet and dry GPIs" or, or, or you, you know sort of voltage tallies or relay closure tallies. And and often, you know, one bit of kit um, it, it uses the opposite standard to, to, to the first bit of kit. And and so that's something. I often have to brew boxes to, to, to make one bit of kit talk to another. But you're right, the, the facility I worked at in the 90s, um, uh, the, the MD there who was, who was an engineer of old, um, he would always brew things if, if he could. So, and I, I sometimes wondered about the economic sense of it. it was got, you got to the point where you, know, you could buy sets of stereo PPMs, very nice ones for you know, six, seven hundred pounds. But we'd still be making them, uh, and uh, and I always thought that the ones you could buy, they always looked a little bit better and uh, and and such. But uh, but but we kind of carried on regardless. And in fact, at the same facility, we had a um, an edit control an edit controller in, in about four of our suites called the uh, the Paltex, um, oh, yes. which um, you know was kind of reasonably popular, sort of late eighties, early nineties, a competitor to the the Sony nine thousand and and um, you know the Ampex Ace and things like that, uh, and. When Paltex went out of business, or, or about a year before they went out of business, they just produced um, code to allow you to run a D3 machine on your Paltex, yes. um, which was one of the first round of digital VTRs, composite digital VTR. Um, uh, and then they went bust just before DigiBeta launched. Um, and because DigiBeta was the mainstay of television editing all through the, the 90s and the noughties, um, you know, we couldn't live with this. Uh, so we... Um, we decided we were going to pull apart the deck definitions because we we were very familiar with how these machines worked and and we 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 worked out how to decompile the EEPROM that contained the deck definitions for different VTRs and we knew that the ballistics of a D3 were very similar to a DigiBeta and we thought that if we could if we could if we could decompile it and put in the right um uh, IDED code so that when the that when, when the uh uh, the edit controller asked the VTR what kind of VT it was. That the, the, the two-digit hex code it returned would match our kind of home-brewed version of the EEPROM, and we'd be away. Um, the only problem was, I think, it just took us over the limit of what a 32k EEPROM, and it's at 32 kilobytes, not megabytes. 32 kilobytes EEPROM would hold, and, and, and so we had to. We knew that the board would work with 64k EEPROMs. However, the motherboard of the machines we had was of a vintage where they never envisaged having to use 64 kilobit EEPROMs. And so there was only 15 of the 16 address lines implemented on this board. And so, and so the MD said to me, he said, well, you're working maintenance this weekend. I'd like you, you know, using Kynar Wire to wire in A15, you know, the, the, the 16th address line yeah, yeah. on this processor board. And, and I did. Uh, but but kind of by the end of it, you know, it was kind of a rat's nest either side of the board and, and just kind of fitted into the card cage, you know, with, with lots of tiny tie wraps holding all these wires in place. And it was about as stable as Charles Manson, but kind of it meant we didn't have to buy another processor board and, and, and kind of save the 800 quid or something, you know. So, you know, although I love, I love getting the soldering iron out and the oscilloscope and, and, and building this stuff, sometimes... There's an economic case for for just buying something that somebody else has made. Um, well, indeed, there is. I mean, just thinking, you know, those are stories from the 80s and 90s. Surely, there's not 
you know, with all the stuff that's manufactured, you don't need to be doing that stuff, and we can just go and have our, our tea now. Well, you'd, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But okay, so I've just popped up on screen now a uh, um, a thing that um, a, a web page from Mackie, you know, who make professional audio gear, and they do a gadget called a big knob. Yeah, really, you know, that's really what it's called, and it's and it's meant to be a, a gadget that addresses all those things of. Oh, I need to, I need a I need to control the volume in my audio suite or my edit suite or my you know whatever, uh, and I need to be able to switch some things in and out and and do a talkback mic and just that and that's all it does. It's not a full up audio mixer. It's just a volume controller, a little bit of switching, and uh, and and some um, talkback, uh, and and it does it really well. Very good. And I've put it in a few rooms and, and excellent. But it doesn't hit the spot all the time. And and if if all you want is a volume control, it's overkill and expensive for just a volume control. But invariably, it doesn't quite do what you want it to do. Um, and so I think there is often a need, particularly in kind of, sort of rooms that are going to be sort of smart audio rooms, things like that, to produce things that do exactly what you want them to do. You know, little kind of control panels. So I've, I've just stuck up a picture of a, um, of a little control desk control panel that we made for, I think, about 12 rooms at one facility, um, where all they wanted was to be able to switch between Audio one, audio two, and audio three and audio four. So they could on layback they could mm-hmm. check the uh, the M and E. Um, they could mono the signal to check for for phase errors, and they could mute the signal. And they had a big volume knob, and 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 that's all they wanted. They wanted that in twelve different rooms, and so there was nothing that really hit the spot for them. But uh, you know, a nice home brewed box did it for them. And although that was you know sort of a few hundred quid to make each one, because you've got to get metal work done, and uh, and you've got to spend a bit of time making it. Um, it was just the thing. I so, so mentioning metal work, um, you know, and you mentioned when we were talking previously that, that when you were when you were running engineering at Molinaire, they had a metal work department. Uh, well, just before I got there, actually, it had been disbanded a little while before I got there. But yes, they'd had a lathes, I understand, and and a, their own milling machine. Somebody told me, which Why? which would have been wonderful. I, I, I had I I did a bit of milling when I was working in a factory once, um, and they're lovely bits of kit, a smashing machine, but. I never did see the Molly one, but uh, right. Well, then, when I worked at the BBC, there was a big metal workshop there, and and those guys would take anything as a challenge. You, you know, you could go and say, "Oh, could you make me a uh, a slantless plate for calibrating a VTR timecode head, and it has to be this dimension to this accuracy," and uh, it would be a, an affront to their dignity if if you thought they couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I I don't do any metal work myself, or, or only very modest amounts. You know, sort of drilling holes and stuff. Um, I, I tend to pass it all on to. Um, my metalwork guy, Brian Broadcast, Andy Turner, who's who runs the metalwork department there, and he's fantastic. He turns things around really quickly and does a really nice job. And I just have to send him a CAD diagram, or not even that. Sometimes I just I just um, tell him what I want, and he interprets it brilliantly. So there's a little project I've got on the go at the moment, and um, there's the sort of the back panel of this this unit. So we've got some uh, some some c- connectors, and he's he's done some nice, you know, he's done all the lettering for me, and uh, oh, just a bit of extra lettering and, and sort of holes and stuff on the front of it, and. Uh, and then, uh, as I think I showed in that other picture, he also does. Um, he also does all these kind of, um, yeah. you know, sort of like nice little, nice little wooden wedges that sit on the desk, and uh, you know, you can, you can wire onto your multi-way switches there. And uh, you know, when that's finished, that makes a very nice addition to a, to, to, to an audio desk where, where they just want to be able to, you know, press a cue light to cue the talent in the booth, or, or switch on their on-air light or their, their mic live light or whatever. So uh, yeah, we do lots of those, and, and, and Andy never lets me down. I've got I've got Bryant's. Um, uh, metalwork page up at the moment. Very, very good. Yeah. Um, but um, so, so, so I suppose th- thinking about some of the things um, that you might want to do. Or we, we just mentioned GPIs and audio and stuff like that. But um, the other thing that people often don't like is having to reach forward and switch inputs on a monitor, or maybe they want the same switch that drives their audio AB monitoring to drive the input on their video monitor. And that's yeah. that's entirely doable, you, you know. That all these monitors have got a, you know, typically it's a Sony. It's got a Hi-Rose connector on the back of it, and and using that connector, you can drive all of the just using just using relay closures, GPIs, you know, um, switches. You can you can drive all the functionality of the monitor. You can even degauss the monitor remotely. <laughs> I didn't like, realise that. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got I've got that up on a little page ripped out of a, a Sony BVM manual up on screen there. Um, and oh, yeah. that, that tradition is carried through into you know modern LCDs. You know, it's a very, very, very useful feature. <laughs> I didn't realise that. The, so, uh, how do you degauss an LCD then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gingerly. <laughs> <laughs> but probably the first thing that um, that the jobbing SI engineer has to deal with, I would say, is wall boxes. You know, that's that's if, if you're building a facility. In fact, I'm I'm just about to embark on the biggest system build of my entire life. There's a there's just one fragment. There's just 
one one quarter of the video matrix diagram there. Oh my lord. Um, and uh, uh, as part of this job, we've got about seventy rooms that need custom wall boxes in. And I've got I've got a, a typical kind of custom wall box, the kind of thing we do up on screen. Uh, you know, should we BNCs yeah. and audio connectors and, and RJ forty fives and even optical connectors on there as well. Um, and, uh, and and that's just a bolt together piece. You know, that's kind of a couple of hours. Uh, you know, bolting those connectors in and and you know, d dressing it nicely and making it work nicely as a as a as a finished piece of wiring is always a, a you know the skill of the mm. wireman and that they always do a nice job so that you know you can take the faceplate off, do whatever you want to do and then reattach the faceplate without it all kind of flying out and becoming a rat's nest and that's particularly important if you've got fibres in there so so I'm, I'm always amazed how how nicely our wiremen seem to uh, finish those. Now what's not obvious from looking at the front of this wall box picture that I've got up is. So I've just now popped up a considerably lower resolution um, yeah, taken yeah. A picture of, of the back of one of those wall boxes. And you can see uh, sort of XLR connectors along the top of, of, of the, of the mm. uh, wall box there. And then a couple of Fono connectors underneath the first two XLRs. And, and what's often a very useful thing to have in a room is, say it's, it's going to be an Avid suite or you know, an assignable room of some sort, um, typically you'll want the stereo output, the monitoring output from the Avid coming back on some tie lines. Uh, and you'll want to put that up on some PPMs and maybe even on a, a more elaborate kind of audio monitoring device. But you'll also often want to feed that into either a, a, an amplifier that's got unbalanced inputs, or maybe you've got a DVD recorder in the room and you want to feed that yeah. as well with Avid. And so rather than having to have you know balancing boxes strapped to the cable tray on the back of the desk and stuff, um, I always uh, I often um, stick a couple of rep coils, a couple of unbalancing coils in, there, yeah. in the back of the wall box. Uh, so that you know that whatever's being fed down those tie lines, off the matrix, off the jackfield, directly from the Avid or whatever, there's also an unbalanced version of it as well. And that's oft often a very handy addition to an edit suite. Well, that's a great idea. I like that. Well, so having, having sort of mentioned rep coils and unbalancing coils, we should really refer you back to our um, our Audio 101 podcast, where we talk a lot about yes. um, you know balanced and unbalanced audio. Um, but essentially, rep coils, which is a BBC expression, I don't think I've, I've heard it much outside the BBC, or, or you know, unbalancing coils are are typically one to one or one to two, two and two um, uh, audio coils, high quality coils um, uh, that, that will um, uh, you know, allow you to balance and unbalance an audio signal without much level loss. And in fact, in the case of, of these ones that you can get from RS, um, which I just got up on the screen at the moment, uh, they, you, can actually get, you can actually cheat six dBs of gain by virtue of the fact that the equipment that you're sending from is probably sending from a high impedance from a low impedance and you're probably driving into a very high impedance so you could you could snag yourself an extra 6 dbs of gain through one of these um uh, you know a bit of bit of bit of cheeky and not a battery in sight not yes. a battery in sight exactly yeah so there's a, just a, a bit a bit more detail about the, how those coils work yeah, so we, we use those an awful lot they're uh, they're, they're, they're um, you often find as a matter those. of interest how do how you how do you type like mount those because they look like um do you mount them on, on vera board or so if i was building so, so let's let, let's let's stick up a picture of of a of a of a box that actually uses those inside the box. So this is a um, this is just a little custom box, um, which was for somebody's audio room where they wanted separate left and right or, uh, uh, volume controls and some muting and things like that. And so uh, we had to derive unbalanced audio within the box. So yeah, you're right that I've got them mounted on Vera board on strip board there. Yeah. Uh, but in the case of that wall box back piece there, which again, apologies for the low resolution picture. They're actually mounted on double-sided uh, Velcro. <laughs> yeah. Oh right! In the back of the wall box there, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, or I mean, you could you could glue them with some epoxy or something like that. That would work quite nicely. So so you know, audio is is often something that we were making um, 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 uh, you, you know custom boxes for, and, and 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 that kind of thing. And the other thing that's always worth bearing in mind is is we, we mentioned earlier is uh, is the system with is the situation with tallies. Um, yeah. Now, what, with tallies and GPIs and things like that, you know, GPI general purpose interface, which you know is, is ubiquitous. Lots, lots of uh, broadcast kit has GPIs, and in fact, a lot of the custom boards we're going to look at later in this podcast, and then in the next podcast, so the the, the Raspberry Pi, the Netium network control board, and the, uh, the the little Arduino we'll be talking about a bit later, they all have you know very simple digital um, uh, relay closure type pins where you can where you can you know tie something down to earth momentarily to cause something to happen. Um, and uh, 
you know, if if if, if you're not kind of um, you know really involved in sort of studio uh, uh, engineering work, you might not know about tallies. But but the tallies have been around since time immemorial, and typically on a big studio camera, it's the red light above yeah. above the lens, so that the, the people on the set know exactly which cameras cut up on air, and. And that tally information is derived from the vision mixer. So the vision mixer knows which camera has been cut to air. And in fact, if you're halfway through a wipe or halfway through a mix, you'll see two cameras with their tally lights on because obviously both of those cameras momentarily are live. You know, they're both contributing to the program output. Yeah. Um, now, in the case of a studio that I built last year, uh, a virtual studio, so, so not, you know, a studio with, uh, with green walls and, and, and no furniture, mm -hmm. um, we based it around the Sony EX3 uh, cameras, which are a fantastic yeah. uh, camera, which is used a lot by road news crews. It's a high-res high camera uh, that shoots onto Sony SBIS cards uh, using um, uh, uh, you know, uh, MPEG-4. Uh, but but mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also entirely serviceable as a... As a um, as a studio camera, it's got HDSDI coming out the back, and it's gen lockable, and it's got all the facilities you might want. You know, remote control of the lens. You can, you, you know, you can connect a CCU to it to control the camera's functionality. Um, but the way it the way it drives its tallies is is tr how traditional cameras work. They expect a relay closure to, to light the tally. Um, but the, the 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 vision mixing system uh, in this virtual studio was a, was a new tech TriCaster which although is a fantastic machine, very good at kind of virtual studio environments and uh, digital video effects and, uh, you know, having, having multiple. Bit of a failure of the internet there. And um, we were talking about um, uh, uh, GPIs and TriCasters and such. So, yeah. so um, <coughs> the, um, the, the, the EX3 uh, tallies don't work in the way that the TriCaster tallies work. The TriCaster gives a little five volt signal to light a tally and the EX3 expects a relay closure. And you say, well, that's fine. You should just, just build a little box and close the relays off that. But, but the five volt um, uh, uh, the signal coming out of the TriCaster wasn't man enough to close a relay. It was just about man enough to light an LED. Um, so, uh, so you have to, uh, you know, a little transistor based circuit to the rescue. And uh, uh, excuse this little sketch, this little <laughs> quick sketch I did before, uh, before we started. <laughs> but this is just, just a very typical. Um, just a single BC108 transistor um, with an adjustable um, 10K resistor on to, to, to bias the, uh, the, um, the gate there. And, uh, and the, there's, the, uh, there's the, 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 the relay coil and, uh, and, and there's my little you know, potential divider circuit to get the right voltage across the relay. And so long as I put the TriCaster 5 volt um, uh, tally signal there, then my relay closes when I want, um, when I want my tally to light up. And, and that's, a, that's a circuit that I use all the time. And in fact, there's the neat version that the, uh, the wireman built for me when I gave him the schematic um, with, the, uh, with the sends to the cameras. And the uh, and the input from the TriCaster and uh, and and yeah that's just a nice little one U box that sits above the TriCaster and makes its tally output uh, exactly what uh, you'd expect um, uh, y you know in a, in a sort of proper studio environment. Excellent, handy little piece of kit. Yeah. Um, then what 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 kind of CAD did you use for that drawing? <laughs> Hand CAD. <laughs> Hand CAD. Yeah. <laughs> Hand aided design. Um, the other thing it's worth uh, mentioning is that a lot of these custom boxes that you wind up building is they, they require mains inside because you, you've got to you yeah. know, produce some DC volts and things like that, and it's worth paying lots of attention to how safe that is. Um, you know, the best thing really is to buy an off-the-shelf uh, DC power supply. You know, and, and, and you know you get that from RS and, and Lindy and all those other places. Um, you know, a power supply that will fit nicely in the one you box. You know, you can velcro it to the floor of the one you box, and. And so I, I, I take the view that, you know, so long as I've got, you know, several layers of insulation between between live volts and any potential fingers, so like a little plastic plate that I glue on and, and I put heat yeah. shrink over all the connectors and, uh, you know, I make sure that there, there are warning notices and I make sure that I take the earth um, to the chassis of the box um, so that mm -hmm. there's no danger there. Um, but, but, but it's always worth bearing in mind that, uh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to make it safe. And uh, if you have the wherewithal, you should also pat test it once you're finished. And stick the obligatory yeah. uh, pat tested uh, sticker uh, on, on on the chassis, so that uh, so, so that you know you've paid attention and that it's it's safe and uh, you, you know nobody's going to get killed by using your little bit of custom uh, jiggery pokery. And of course, we did have um, a little podcast uh, which you might want to flash up there. Yes. Uh, which reminds people about the the mains. Absolutely, so. we should point you right back to the uh, to, to, to to the the early. Uh, so let's let's pop that up on screen there. Where are we? Uh, somewhere on yeah, there we go so uh yeah we've done quite a few so far so, so i think that was uh that was a few months ago now back in february main safety there you go
Good so, grief. So, so back on, on, on Blip TV or on YouTube uh, uh, to watch. Um, so that's uh, that, that's mains and and the other thing that makes sort of these uh, these kind of builds nice um, is is just knowing you know kind of what kind of buttons you know look nice when they're when mm. they're when they're stuck on a podium uh, a podium plate like this and and uh, I normally I normally go straight to RS uh, you know for sourcing these bits and um, uh, you know typically it's the, uh, the, the, the this um, Om, Om, Omron range. Um, uh, you, you know, and and the the thing to note, which I always forget when I'm when I'm when I'm putting these parts lists together and buying these bits, is that with these switches, it's not the switch body that dictates whether it's a latching or a momentary switch. It's actually the the piece that the switch connects to, which holds the lamp, which which also holds the uh, um. which also holds the uh, the nice little coloured um, uh, you know button piece. It's that that it's that that's the bit that dictates whether it's a momentary switch or a or a latching switch. And of course, in some scenarios, you know, for a Q light, you just want a momentary switch. In other scenarios, you know, lighting a a mic live light or, or the on air light or whatever, you want a, a latching switch. So that's always always worth bearing in mind. That's bit me in the backside on more than one occasion. It's worth knowing that. Yes. Yeah. Um, the the other thing. Uh, so we're talking about audio suites and um, and such. Uh, a job I was on recently, um, we uh, had three very high-end audio rooms as part of the, the build. Um, uh, we started, you know, at the start of the job, which was way back at the start of this year, sort of January or February this year, and we ran all the inter-room cables between the audio suites on the understanding that when the builders built the acoustically solid walls between the rooms, they'd they'd make channels for our cables, then finish the walls around our cables, you know, so that they could then come out of the uh, uh, the front wall of the audio suite um, and or, or up into the yeah. roof where the where the on air lights were going to be. When we got back in August, no, no July, we realised they chopped all the cables we'd put in for lighting um, the mic live lights and the Q lights in the booth and things like that. And it was, well, what on earth do we do? Yeah, you know, we can't we can't drill holes in these walls now because they they've been acoustically finished. Very expensive to, yeah. to, to do that. Um, and I found this fantastic company in China that makes a whole range of RF control boards that work at four point three gigahertz. I don't know if they're licensed in this country. They they have a they have a they have a reseller in this country, so I can only assume they are legal in this country. And and these boards. Yeah. Um, you can configure them to be momentary or latching, uh, you, you, you know, multiple channels fed off a single frequency or, 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 or four distinct frequencies feeding the same board. And they work over hundreds of meters. I, I, I sent one of our wiremen uh, right down to the other end of the little industrial estate where our workshop is. And, uh, you know, he was kind of shouting distance away, like maybe 200 meters away. And I was still, you know, firing this Q light, and it was still lighting up in his hand. Oh, wow. So the, the, these would work, you know, throughout entire buildings, and uh, I intend to make more use of them. I'm, uh, you know, it was it was a real kind of get me out of jail uh, uh, discovery, and they're not expensive. Are they expensive? No, there's ten pounds that little board there, and you have to buy all the other little bits and bobs, you have the little transmitter board and things like that. But they implement really nicely, and so I built some of those into into custom, little custom boxes, you know, to kind of go in the ceiling just behind. The, the mic live light or the on air light or the or the cue light in the booth for the for the talent to know when to start speaking, and um, you know it basically saved saved my bacon. It meant that uh, even though the builders had chopped out the cables that we'd run for those things, we could still we could still implement it. Excellent. So I was very very, very clever. Yeah, very pleased to discover that, and I, I found them through eBay. But I've since been buying straight from their website. So what are they called? So they are called Electronic Made in. CHN. CHN, yes. Med Made in Chinese. Ch 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 Chinoise, Chinese, yeah. Well, that, that's actually the name of the company, email. But, so, yeah, they, they do a lot of stuff, which is, uh, which is just the job. Very handy. And you can buy straight off the website. And, um, yep. Yeah, fantastic. Well, should be having a little look at that later. So, um, so that's um, that's that's kind of audio suites. The, the, the other thing that um, um, is worth bearing in mind is that you often have to build just passive volume um, controls or passive pads. How often um, have people, um, you know, got to match two audio levels and you've only got, you know, a small amount of physical space and and no money and, and no power supply with which to do it. Um, and, and audio pads, although people regard them as a bit of a dark art, a bit of a black art. They aren't all that, you know, they're not that hard. And there are many websites, I've just, I've just got um, uh, Ready Mag Online, um, who do lots of, sort of radio yeah. engineering things. I've got, I've got their website up on screen at the moment with, with the, with, with the um, instructions for, for T1 
T-networks and Pi networks for making audio attenuators for, for unbalanced and balanced signals. And, and if you think about a T-pad like that, um, actually, if you want to make a, a passive volume control, um, that's exactly what uh, a variable resistor is. If you, if you, if you imagine yes. you, you can move that center point there, you know, up and down through the resistance range of R1 and R2, that's exactly what a, 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 a potentiometer is. And so, you know, yeah. log, log B 10K pots are just perfect for, um, for, 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 for as, as, a, as a passive uh, volume control. And I've, I've implemented that more times than I care yeah. to remember. It's just, just fine, you know. It gives a nice range if it's a log B characteristic and uh, yeah. you know just 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 what you need really um so 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 that's i suppose that's a, that's a bit of a, a bit of a, a roundup of 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 some of the tricks and nonsense that i use for for custom brewing boxes and, and little things that people say oh wouldn't it be nice if i could just have a button on the desk that put my monitor into component mode and told my audio mixer to bring up the two track return you, you know it's often yes often it, thing. it's well worth remembering that um you know when you're dealing with particularly these days, everything is computers. You don't actually have to, it's no, it's quite important sometimes to, to take your head away from that and just think actually what we're dealing with here is something fairly low tech, um, because actually a low tech answer is, is going to be very robust yeah. if you can put it in. Exactly, if there's no microprocessor unless, unless in there. Through your, yep, say again. If there's no microprocessor in there, you know, it can't crash. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, cool. I've got a friend um, who um, who works in the IT department for a healthcare um, provider, and uh, he 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 wanted a um, he'd suffered an air conditioner failure at, um, at, at in one of his server rooms, and and nobody had noticed, and lots of servers had sort of melted, and he caused him lots of trouble. And so he wanted something that would warn him when temperatures were getting to a certain level, and then and then do other things when they got to another level. And I think yeah. his IT, his main sort of IT contractor. Had uh, had offered him an eight thousand pound box, which when he when he looked a bit closely, it was a Dell server <laughs> with, uh, with with a temperature reading board in the back of it, and, uh, and you know, and, and a license for Windows Server two thousand eight, and lots of other things. And I wound up building him a little box just based around uh, Netium um, uh, uh, network board, Thanks. which could you know send out uh, an email when the temperature got too hot, and could turn off the power when things were starting to catch fire, kind of thing. Um, but but you know you 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 could brew that box for two hundred quid you know and uh, yeah. not not the eight thousand pound server. <laughs> um, so with all so that's all all kind of that's all analog electronics. It's all old school. It's all it's all. Mm -hmm. But occasionally just hits the spot. Just what you want. It just does. The the, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, in terms of home brewing and custom electronics and you know making things that do the job is Arduino. I don't know if you've come across Arduino at all. Yes, I was going to get one for Christmas, but it, it didn't appear. So <laughs> the, the dog Another ate it one. when it was under the Christmas tree. <laughs> yes, one of oh, oh, socks, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, uh, Arduino is is a is, is a system that originates from Italy, and it's a um, it's a little kind of oh, Disney, yeah, know. yeah. And, and and the guy who originally developed it uh, did so um, so that artists and and sort of visual kind of people could could have some sort of development platform where they could build lighting displays and things like that. That was his kind of thing, you know. But it's just such a good sort of um, you know open system that it suits itself to so many things, and it's got a real following on the internet. The last four years, um, you know, there's just numerous sort of uh, repositories of Arduino code and things like that. And, and, and so this is this is a basic Arduino. This is an Arduino Uno, which is just the basic Arduino, uh, but does everything you know Arduino can do. But 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 yeah. it's 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 got it's got a single um, serial port which is exposed as a USB connector as you can see there. Uh, but it's also yeah. it's also exposed as a straight um, RS two three two type serial port there as well. They're the same port, but but just depending on which one you tap onto, you obviously got to get the levels you know voltage levels right and things like that. Um, uh, uh, but, but from a from from a programming point of view, they're the same port, and, and it can be powered either oh. over the USB interface. Uh, so obviously, when you plug it into a computer, it powers up, and you can then dump code into it or interrogate it or whatever. Or it's also got a um, you know a little five volt input jack there, and in fact, you, you can get to the uh, the pins on the board to power it, um, you know, just by soldering onto the board kind of thing. And um, uh, it's uh, there's a little voltage regulator on there which allows you to bring off three and a half volts and a stabilized five volts off the board if you want to use that for something else. Uh, and um, 
you know, just 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 a, I mean, you know, I think I think you can pick those up on eBay for a tenner. They're very modestly priced really? little gadgets, yeah. And it's, the power is in this little this little chip here, which is made by I did I should have looked this up beforehand. I didn't know, but I think it's a national national semiconductor chip. I can't remember what, but it's it's a chip that runs a uh, a byte code version of C. So if you're at all familiar with programming, and you kind of did you learn your programming before the 90s, then undoubtedly you would have dealt with C. Nowadays, maybe not so much. You probably learn Java or C++ or any of the other mm -hmm. object-orientated, event-driven type programming languages. But if you were doing a computing degree in the early 80s, like me, um, then then you know C was was definitely at the forefront. And you know, and it's it's very simple to understand because like Pascal and Basic and things like that. It just runs sequentially, and it's not. It's got no concept of objects, and it's got no concept of of um, being event driven at all, interrupt driven. Oh right, okay. So, so um, for 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 a chap that didn't uh, do that, um, how hard do you think it is to pick up? Oh, I think it's remarkably easy. So, so my my um, eighteen year old kind of picked it up immediately. You know, kind of he had no trouble whatsoever. So just, just one more one more sort of like thing about the hardware. So that's that's a basic mm. Arduino Uno. And this piece here is an Arduino it's built very much expandability in mind. This is this is the Ethernet board and, and they call the board shields. And and you know when you yes. when you stick them together you can see why. Because it kind of shields the original board. And that the pins pass straight through and and, uh -huh. and and you you make them together and then there's you can you can you can stack them up you know you can put more boards on and they they have shields for everything for for bluetooth communication um for for lots of different things um and in fact there's an uh, there's a board called an, an arduino mega which has the ethernet board built in as part of the design but it's a, a mega is essentially just those two boards sandwiched together and repackaged oh. um, so there's not a lot of variation between the boards. Uh, an Arduino Uno is the place to start. You get, get one of those and you start monkeying around and testing it. So obviously this, I've been waving this board around. It's not powered. But if I, uh, if I take my uh, USB cable, which is connected to this here computer, and I, uh, I, and I jack it into my Arduino, you can see the power LEDs lit up. And you might also notice there's a green LED on there that's winking away. And the reason for that is because... Well, I'll save the reason for that. I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about about um, a good way to kind of get into Arduino. I've got the the, uh, the Michael Margolis um, Arduino cookbook, which is an O'Reilly book. And there's, a, oh, yes. there's a big old paper copy of it there, um, which uh, I found to be excellent. And uh, I think if you if you buy the paper book, you can also uh, you can also download it, you know, onto your uh, your tablet computer. That's an iPad, but other fine tablets are available. Um, uh, and uh, that's brilliant. Um, that that really was my, my, the best starter I could I could have, have hoped for the Arduino cookbook. I'd recommend that if you get an Arduino, get the book. Um, uh, well worth it. Okay. Um, there's as I say, lots of websites where they, they, they've got people brewing things with Arduino, and we'll get to that in a minute because um, the enough already is just the best project I've seen for Arduino, and it'll make you laugh. But um, but uh, getting back to um, no, I don't want to be there. Getting back to um, uh, Arduino. Uh, the Arduino website again is, is 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 excellent and has got lots of examples and uh, you know the code for it and stuff like that. And so let's explain a bit a bit more about the board. So when the board powers up, yeah. uh, it essentially kind of boots up you know within a second, and then whatever yeah. software was previously loaded into the flash memory, it just starts running that. Um, and the software looks a bit like so. Let me I've, I've got the Arduino got the Arduino uh, development environment running here. So I've got uh, I've just popped up. Um, a very very simple bit of Arduino code, and it's the it's the code that I just downloaded into the board that you saw start running when I plugged the board in, and it's just called mm -hmm. Blink. And uh, let's see if I can uh, make that a bit clearer. There we go. Um, and and so looking at this this fragment of code here, this is a complete Arduino sketch. That's the word they use to describe software that runs in an Arduino. They call it a sketch. Uh, and and uh, you know if you're familiar with C at all, this will start to look very familiar. Um, uh, so so uh, in the header of the of the of the file, where where we're, we're defining variables, we're declaring things, um, you know we're mm -hmm. assigning um, uh, uh, variables to to, to to conditions, and then once once the the, the setup part has run, um, we then drop into um, uh, just the loop. So so we've got void setup. Uh, and some stuff that gets set yeah. up, and then we've got void loop, um, and, and and the curly braces, the curly brackets indicate the start and the end of the loop, and whatever's between those curly braces, and although in in this case it's only four lines of code, could be four thousand lines of code, uh, when when the Arduino has 
has gone through and, and done all those things, including jumping to subroutines and, 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 and all that kind of thing, it goes back up and starts the loop again. So in the case of this sketch, uh -huh. what does it do? Well, digital write is a function that allows you to write out to one of the, one of the digital pins we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, digital write, uh, LED, we defined LED to be uh, output pin 13 previously. <coughs> it, says, it says, take that pin high, <coughs> and then it says, uh, delay 1000, uh, 1000 milliseconds, and then digital write LED low. So it says, make, uh, you know, make that pin go high, make that pin go low, wait another 1000 milliseconds a second, and then just by, by, because it's an Arduino, it, it runs it again, just loops back and runs it again. And so you know, the result of that is, can you see the green LED winking away? Just so oh, happens yeah. that a, a couple of the digital lines, they've been good enough to give you LEDs on the board to kind of get you going so you can see those digital lines working but if i put if i you know if, if, if i went across whichever the digital lines it is on there um you know i'd see i'd see you know i'd, I'd see a square wave um and so what are, they're the digital output lines there and uh, on on the on the bottom connect so the digital output lines across the top digital outputs and digital inputs so it can it can read um uh, digital values and it can output digital values and then we've got some analog inputs and outputs on the bottom so there's a couple of a to d's and d to a's on the board as well as a serial port. Um, so that's remarkably useful. Um, the little Arduino project I'm working on at the moment is to, um, is to read VTR timecode and, uh, and, and do things with that. Now, it's been done 100 times before. You can go to Mr. Hitech, and he'll sell you yeah. very nice boxes. To, or or there's, a, there's, a, there's a company in, um, in Las Vegas called Adrienne Electronics, and they do lots of not quite custom, but you know, sort of solutions to allow you to extract time code from a 422 stream and you know embed it into the vertical interval of, of another video signal that you, you know but but um you know so they all those things are done already but but if you wanted you know if you've got a slightly off the beaten track requirement you can probably do it with an arduino i mean it's not a blisteringly fast processor i think the, i think it just runs at eight megahertz so so compared right. to your modern uh, you know computers <laughs> with th three gigahertz you know core i7 processors it's a snail but but it just does what it does very well um now the uh the, the project i really like um and i found it on the on the make website now if you if you, if you follow make at all that there are there are a bunch of um people um in the states who publish make magazine and they also have make affairs and they just encourage people to to build things and and you know electronics you know craft um you know, they 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 just sort of like really stand up people. Now this guy uh, got an Arduino, and one of the shields you can get, one of the little add-on boards you can get for Arduino, is um, is a video shield which ca which allows you to uh, capture, you know, read a video signal and then a a write out a video signal. So in its default mode, it just this would be a PAL or an NTSC, a, a PAL, an, an analog composite signal, yeah, uh, and. Uh, and it's you know the board when the board powers up it just passes the video signal straight through but you can do simple things to it you can overlay graphics on top of it you can um, you can read the vertical interval of it so if you wanted to build a if you wanted to build a little vitsy reader um you know the a 10 pound arduino board you know the 17 pound video shield and you know a couple of afternoons of tinkering uh and you could do it very easily you, know, you could read vitsy's off, a, off a, a video signal now what this chap did and he built this thing called the enough already and i encourage you to go and watch the, the the video on youtube it's so funny he um he's he, he built a, a an arduino project that read uh the closed caption um data from a video signal so in america like we used to in britain they they have um, they're mandated by law actually television broadcasts have to have closed captions which you know yes, do, yeah. equates to our um teletext you know page 888 um, subtitles that we used to have that we don't really have anymore in fact our, our subtitles are now delivered as part of the mheg stream um over dvb but but um in america they still have closed captions because they recognize that a lot of people haven't yet upgraded to america uh, to, to digital televisions so so his his board reads the closed caption um uh, uh you know subtitle data and he maintains a little database of celebrities <laughs> that he doesn't want to hear about you know the jennifer lopez's the lady gargas um you, you know of this world um, whenever his board sees mention of, of any of the people in his little database um, uh, using a little infrared LED, it just mutes his television for 30 seconds because he doesn't <laughs> want to hear any of that celebrity nonsense. You know, for, if, if he's just idly got the television on in the background while he's working, he doesn't want to hear stuff about celebrities. So I thought, 
I mean, it's a funny thing, but it's just a brilliant illustration of what you can do with a with a kind of a couple of afternoons and you know twenty or thirty pounds of parts. And uh, it's you know any, anybody who can start tinkering around with the with the very good Arduino software, and and, and the Arduino software has just just dozens of examples. I mean, hundreds of examples. So that's that's from their example library, but uh, they really get quite quite sort of involved. You know, reading sensors, reading analog voltages. That there's 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 quite a lot of libraries online where people have written, for example, Twitter clients. So you might want to oh, yes. you might want to get some information out via Twitter. Um, I don't know. You, you know, you can think of a hundred things, can't you? You might want to read the state of something. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, when 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 a time code value gets to a certain level, you tweet it or something. You know, it's, it's <laughs> silly, but 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 there you can imagine ways of doing that. Um, well, so, yeah, you can mind bubbles with that. It, yeah, go on. Sorry. And so it's it's like it's like a kind of an open source toolbox of um, you know kind of electronic uh, and software kind of building. Um, uh, just, 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 I'm, 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 I'm very taken with it, and, and I'm, I'm really enjoying um, fiddling around with, with, with Arduino and, uh, and getting into it. I noticed that as well. I went to the, um, I went to the, um, um, the um, Alan Turing ex- exhibition at the Science Museum a few weeks ago, and I noticed that all their um, uh, demo um, displays all run on Arduino, and I was lucky enough to, to chat to uh, one of the developers. Um, he just happened to be there. I don't know. I think he was downloading some new code into one of the, the exhibits or something, and uh, and I said, "Oh, yeah, these are all running on Arduino." And he said, "Yeah." And he was he was you know, didn't, he, he couldn't have given me enough time to chat about some of the things oh, they're doing. You know? So um, so yeah, I would encourage you if um, if you've got anything in that line, any kind of development, uh, you know, involving sort of slightly harder stuff that you wouldn't want to tackle just with wiring it with transistors and things like that, to to consider Arduino. Well. Um, consider Arduino until you've seen the next podcast where I'm going to talk a little bit more about another board which is equally as sort of um, uh, configurable and usable and a bit more orientated towards network usage um, so you know if, you can, if you've got an internet connection or you've got a network a LAN connection you can kind of use these boards to get data between places or, or stuff like that and then finally we'll wrap up the next podcast with, uh, with talk of the Raspberry Pi uh, because oh, be, of course I'll, you finally got yours. Oh you? no, no, I've I've got the email from RS oh, yeah. saying that your Raspberry Pi is on the way. It'll be here like next week or something. So very very oh, excited so. about that. That's that, that's the, uh, the 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 new um, uh, little computer on a credit card um, that, uh, that that's um, you know sort of twenty quid and is a fully functioning Linux machine uh, that really is aimed at. Uh, kind of uh, you know this kind of development and you know kids learning to program and kind of home brewing and, and stuff like that because it doesn't matter you know it wouldn't matter if you broke one of these things it wouldn't be the end of the world you, you know um, so uh, so very excited about the Raspberry Pi and um, y- you know thinking about projects I might be able to do with that well I think it's going to be an absolutely fascinating uh, podcast as well I think this one has been very interesting indeed just hearing uh, what a modern uh, SI engineer gets up to in the quiet of his workshop um, <laughs> with his Arduino and his soldering iron and I'm sad to see that you don't have your own set of metal punches but um, <sighs> you don't you, <laughs> I did at one point have my own set of um, punches with letters on and I dare say somewhere there might still be the odd aluminium 1U panel with some slightly up and down writing where it was punched in letter oh, by letter right. <laughs> well, just but a- that uh, that would date me, so we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just I, 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 I got into sending CAD diagrams of panels to, to Andy at Bryant um, a long time ago, probably before I worked for Route Six, the SI company I work for at the moment, but when I was still running facilities in um, in, in um, you know editing companies. And yeah. I remember once I sent. Uh, if you're familiar with AutoCAD, um, yeah. AutoCAD has an auto dimension feature. So if you if you if you do a, a dimensionally accurate version of the panel you want to, to have done um, you can then put the dimensions on so I did this and when you auto dimension circles particularly depending on whether you start dragging the auto dimension from the top left or the top right it will either put the the dimension arrows inside the circle or outside the circle to indicate how big the circle is and without paying any attention I left it with the dimension arrows outside the circle and I sent this this CAD diagram off to Andy, assuming that he'd look at it before he fed it into the uh, into the, the engraving machine. <laughs> and the panel that came back to me <laughs> had the dimension markers engraved onto it, along with volume, 
audio one stroke two mute you know it also had the dimension markers for one hole and I thought well, I've just got to hang on to this and I've lost it <laughs> but but from then on <laughs> I always made sure the dimension markers were inside the hole where it'd be punched out oh wonderful what a lovely story <laughs> But well, thank you, Phil, for another splendid uh, podcast there, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Jolly good, yes. Well, uh, it, it'll be a couple of weeks. So we, we've got IBC in the way, haven't you? Haven't we? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, and I haven't yet got my Raspberry Pi, so I haven't had a chance to fiddle around with it yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to that. And um, and uh, it's been 45 minutes, and uh, we said we never wanted these to go uh, that long. So um, I thank you, Hugh, and I will see you soon. <laughs>